So our panelists today, we have Colin Bramel, Julie Walker, who you've heard from this morning, Cody Dooley with Kimberly Clark, and then Joan Cook as well. Welcome. So I hope everyone's having a great morning. As Alicia said, my name's Alex McCoy. I have not been in shopper marketing as long as Julie or Karen. This is still fairly new to me. Um, I'm working mostly in sales of digital solutions and IT, and that's kind of where I've been the last few years. So I'm still playing catch up. That's why I'm not sitting here, but I get to sit right here. So we're really excited. Um, Alicia has put together some fantastic questions, um, as well as with some of the comments from our panel some of the major problems that brands are facing today that we wanted to really open up and try to address um, whenever we're thinking about how we're going to design a digital strategy in shopper marketing. So our first question, and please, like she had said, excuse me, feel free to text questions as you think of them. It's 479-445-5000. They'll pop up right here, I'll see them, and at the end, um, we'll go through those first and then open the floor for any additional questions. So our first question, what things should we as marketers and or sales professionals focus on first when it comes to digital marketing? Julie, do you wanna start us out? Cody? Sure, Um, I I think I mentioned it uh, initially. I really believe strongly that you need to start with what your key business drivers are. Um, Joan mentioned it in terms of lead with some insights uh, with regard to your audience and then let um, your professional support organizations, your agencies, whoever else you're leaning on to help you with your digital marketing plans and strategy um, help you fine tune with those foundational blocks in place. I think absent that, um, no matter how good the partner is that you hire, they're going to miss the mark in what they bring back. I think I'll just add that it's really important to understand what, uh, again, what your business strategy is, and especially with Shopper, really closing the loop in to drive those purchases. So a lot of our brand digital um, dollars are really to drive brand equity. And so our responsibility as Shopper marketers is to really uh, drive the sale and purchase. So what is it going to make important, what is it important to our shopper that's really going to drive that conversion back to our retailer? So I think, um, I heard this analogy a little bit ago. So before hanging the curtains, the drapes, and painting the walls, you want to have a good foundation. So a lot of things that I've seen working in shopper marketing, SEO, content marketing in the past is a lot of people want to jump right to you know, the nitty gritty and get, get you know, they want to jump in full force to the, to, uh, you know, paid advertising or, or, or the, probably the most advanced shopper marketing techniques, right? And so focus on that foundation first on, 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 on your, find out who your consumer is and what that consumer market demographic looks like at each retailer that you're going to be, um, you know, uh, uh, marketing to. Um, and so focus on, go back to the basics. So go back to, uh, basic, good content, good images, good uh, basic SEO. Do all the things that are, um, you know, free or or low cost, and allow that to organically grow. You know, your 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 items or or your company. So. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Is that working? Hello. Um, I, I'd have to agree. I think um, one of the things that we've started doing is taking a look at. Um, Google Analytics to begin with um, to help us to understand what keywords are driving search. Once we have that, we can imp- you, that informs what should be on our item page. Once we have that, that can inform some of the keywords that need to be in our ads uh, and, and also in our social content. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I know Eric, he's one of the SEO wizards in the room as well. And there's, you know, staying up to date on that as well and understanding the constant changes in the algorithm. So Fred is a, you know, a, a, one of the Google analytic or Google SEO updates, algorithm updates that they just did and staying on top of that. And so finding that foundation, but that foundation, you know, you need to expand and put di- additional layers on that over time. Even though that, you know, you are building this, this amazing project, you got to update it, you know? Um, and so staying on top of that and the, and the SEO, the content and finding, you know, keywords to organically grow um, your, 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 uh, your items. So I'm going to follow up with that, and Joan, you had said it in your discussion about the importance of having your item page 
completed and optimized. If you don't have that, you might as well just forget trying to do anything beyond that in digital. Mm -hmm. Do you care to maybe expand on that and, and talk why is that such a fundamental part of your foundation in digital strategy? Yeah, I mean, that item page is, is there to answer questions. You know, if, you, if you're selling a, an item, a cracker, and you're gluten-free, you need gluten-free, you want to see that in the content. It has to answer my questions. And it also has to convert. So why should I buy that cracker over any other cracker? It's The content has to inspire me as well. So it's got to be more than a picture of the box, four different sides of the box. It needs to be, you know, maybe a recipe, maybe a, a video of how to, to make something. Like really use that space on those item pages to help you to tell the story. Definitely, and one of the big things when I was working, so I worked with Michelin Tires and BF Goodrich, and that was one of the biggest clients. We, we manage uh, 2,600 SKUs on Walmart.com, Amazon.com, and other uh, retailers for them. And one of the things, one of our biggest projects that we worked on is, is taking that content and then basically reaching each consumer style. So you have the you know, type A, such as myself, who wants to read this elaborate paragraph you know, about this tire. And then you have people that just want to skim the headers, right? Or bullet points. And you want people that want, you know, millennials. I'm also one of those. Sorry. And that, I know, <laughs> that have, uh, you know, that have, you know, they want to see graphic design. They want to see videos. They want to see stuff that, you know, attractive graphics that are, that are appealing. And so, you know, m customizing each of your product pages so that each consumer type can go on there, have their questions answered, and because it's, it's now it's going to a pull marketing. Consumers want to go to your page and pull off the material and the questions and the answers to the questions they have. They don't want to be fed them. So basically, customize each of your pages so that the consumers can, 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 can confidently click add to cart and buy with no questions. Give them confidence through your content. So can I, can I just make one comment on that? Um, for any of you who've shopped your own items on Walmart versus Amazon, okay? Because again, we're, we're, most of the people in this room, I think, are focused on Walmart and optimizing what, we've, what we're doing with Walmart or Jet uh, online as well as in store. And um, one of the things I've noticed, there's a big breakage on regimen at, at walmart.com that does not exist on Amazon. Amazon does a fantastic job of uh, pushing you into a regimen purchase, and Walmart doesn't. And I think as shopper marketers, that ought to be a place after the ad page for the specific item is optimized that you ought to be worried about what else in your portfolio mm -hmm. um, should be purchased. Those are great comments, for sure. Do we have anything else from the crowd? If you have anything relevant to this right now with a question, would anyone like to speak up and ask anything while we're on it? Yes. So, on the supplier side, do you typically take ownership for the optimization, which is the biggest problem I've seen? I've suggested optimization strategies in the past, but I've gotten a little bit of pushback on whether that's the direction you want to go. So, how do you bridge that gap between saying that that's a worthwhile asset to pursue versus who are you trying to convince? Your company or who are you um, trying to convince? I think it's building programs out. So, how do you build strategies? So, what are you going to start? Well, what are you going to start? Well, I, I think um, that you're asking um, who can you, who's making those decisions or who can you influence because the, I think I'm hearing that maybe you're being briefed to do something more decorating oriented, drapes and painting when, when you feel like it needs to be focused on fixing the foundation, but maybe your client doesn't, isn't responsible for that and therefore isn't letting you engage there. Am I correct? So I, 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 think the, I think the key is whether you're an agency, whether you're a shopper marketer, whether you're a salesperson, whether you're a brand person, we talked about shoppers a team sport. I think if you notice there's a breakage in the foundation, um, you have to call a timeout. And if, if, you're specific, if you're an agency and your specific client isn't responsible, say, how do we get the brand team engaged? Who can I call? Because we want to help 
uh, ensure that the foundation is filled. Otherwise, you're wasting your money on the microsite or the promotional piece because th the basics are, are going to have so much breakage. That's what I would recommend. One, one, one more thing to build off of that. So prior to uh, getting in the business world, I was actually a full-time evangelist. So I feel like it's carried over very well into this position of e-commerce because I feel like I'm an evangelist of e-commerce now and of content marketing and branding and, 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 and poll marketing. And so one of the hardest, one of the biggest tasks, probably harder than getting rid of choir robes at churches I've been to, and, and, or, you know, is I've had to convert, you know, non-millennial, I'm trying to be careful what I say, you know, account managers, careful. account managers, hey, I, I, <laughs> okay. So, non, you know, account managers who are kind of stuck in, you know, their older um, methods of, of, of shopper marketing. And so, like, billboards, 2018, they're up 12%. I mean, I want you, as you're driving home today, I want you to look in every car, okay? Four out of the five passengers you see out of those four or five cars will be texting, they'll be looking at their phones. And probably five out of the five drivers will also be on their phones. So nobody's really paying attention to that anymore, right? Um, so really going in there and saying, hey, you know, this works, it's not a fad, you know, we need to build this foundation on this. Before we go into these, you know, you know WMX or these, these paid advertised services, why don't we enhance our content and max that out first? Max out our SEO, enhance our organic traffic. I've sat in meetings with WMX and some of the suppliers I've worked with, and they're going in there with no enhanced content, no SEO whatsoever. And they're about to write a check saying, hey, you know, we're gonna you know, do this paid advertising, but yet they're not allowing their page to grow organically. So, like I said, so going back to the basics, going back to where, okay, we are going to, you know, SEO, build that foundation, you know, content, get those consumers that way, and then look into that. So it's just kind of changing the mindset and maybe looking at it in a way that you can, um, you know, fiscally w with money, saying, hey, you know, this will be cheaper. Why don't we try this first to enhance that later on, and I'll save money for the budget this year and focus, you know. So in, in my, in the past, working on that, it's ended up becoming a budget discussion where we've moved money around, so. Great, great question, thank you. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I'm going to come back to that on um, in just a minute. This actual this next question is: How are we going to determine the best channels for your digital marketing dollar? So I, I think we'll probably loop around to that. Maybe Cody, would you like to tell us um, again? How do you determine the best channels for your digital marketing dollars? Yeah, and that's a, a really challenging question because every year it changes. So every year we look at what we did the prior year and we really count on our um, providers to give us the information they can in terms of what is measurable in terms of, um, for us it's really the actionable item. So the, the click to action or click to cart or what have you. Um, so we're, we're measuring them in terms of what the measurements that we can get back from them. Also what Joan was saying earlier, you know, those additional insights on who that shopper really is, you know, we're taking that to the year, the next year planning and saying, okay, well, because of last year, we determined that we thought these shoppers were these groups of people, but now we're learning that they're these, and now we need to target them in a unique and different way. So it really does change, and we have to keep an agile perspective on our plans, um, because we can't just do what we did every year, because as we all know, uh, technology is changing, shoppers are changing, and we have to be where they are, um, and we have to take advantage of those that are experts in this field and having them t teach us what those new tools and tricks are, where is the measurement. Um, I think that's really key right now is that's the question we get asked every day is what's really driving sales, um, and that it's a challenging question to say that this particular thing drove this many sales because mm -hmm. um, it's not one just thing, one thing. We all know that. It's a combination of a lot of things, but um, we really do need to look at um, some of those measurement tactics to, to, to make those best decisions. Um, this will touch, I think, on your question, because I think that uh, ratings and reviews is a big part of optimizing your spend in the digital space, mm -hmm. particularly. Um, CARS, C-A-R-S, content, action. So, you, I mean, have a buy it now button, have a get a sample, 
have something actionable, ratings and reviews, search. And I think if you focus your spend against cars, you will optimize uh, typically the foundation of your, your digital spend. Bizarre voice. She asked who Walmart's provider was to provide uh, ratings and reviews into walmart.com, and it's Bizarre Voice. So a follow-up for that is how can we measure the impact on those investments? So ROI, obviously, from a brand perspective, whenever your KPI is how, you know, driving sales and you're spending all this money, of course, the person above you is asking, did that bring back an ROI, yes or no? And most of the time, you know, you hear from solution providers saying, well, and that's where the murky waters kind of, people are having to tread and not really sure, especially digital spending with all the, aver um, so, excuse me, with all the large brands coming forward at national level saying stop spending and spend smartly. What does that mean? How do I spend smartly? How, how can I prove my ROI if it's not just black and white on a report? I don't know how you all are doing it. Um, one of the campaigns, or several of the campaigns that I've worked on, we um, onboard retail link data into the, uh, the programmatic media. And that way, when we're targeting, we're also seeing you know, how much engagement we're getting for stores, and then we can correlate the sales numbers with the m amount of engagement. And of course, if we've got you know 28% engagement rate, we generally have a 28 to 30 percent lift in sales right around that store and and then you can overlay you know your coupon redemptions and all of those different tactics to layer up to see which tactics work the best and the other big thing is to set up test and control properly on the front end because when you you know you set a, a campaign and you do only programmatic here and you do only social here or whatever you do you have to have that to help you understand what the results were. I think a big thing also, um, so coming from you know doing a lot of replenishment and retailing analytics, um, painting the picture with sales data is is, is going to be a, you know a given. We are going to have to do that. But something that you know I've seen throughout my career has been a great way to measure this is through page traffic um, and SEO analysis. So studying more people, seeing how many people are getting to your page. See, you know, analyzing different clicks, who's clicking on what, who's viewing what content, um, and then also like new words. So like seeing how you're ranking and how you're going up in Google and the search rankings on Walmart as well. Because um, people are going to be hitting your pages, it's going to be bringing you up in sales and invisibility. And seeing you as a brand, as a whole, you know, I mean, it's one of the best branding tools there is, is, you know, e-commerce. So, you know, um, you know measuring the, the traffic that you're getting um, and then doing in-store studies or analysis to see kind of how the e-commerce is playing out with your in-store sales, seeing if there's a lift with that. Because a lot of times you, you'll be getting in-store increases in sales, you know, from pickup today um, and so forth um, because of your online, you know, initiatives. So and one thing, you know, and we're talking about where are the best places to spend your money. And I want to kind of my, my view and kind of where I focus on with my suppliers that I've worked with is the future. So if you look at the news, just a supplier community released, and I love the emails, they're super helpful, released how um, in France, you know, pick up today and, and, and Amazon's gonna be, you know, managing all that, and they're allowing that to happen in, in France, which is something that's been a big battle with, uh, you know, these big retailers and um, ship to home and pick up today uh, to come into those areas. And so less than 2% of the US right now is using in-store pickup, right? And then you got you know Japan, which is 16, 18 percent. You got France, which is 14 percent. So you have, we have a lot of growth in that area. So focusing those dollars on the content that's going to help use your you know your e-commerce pages to increase store sales or pickup sales, I think is a great place to spend your money and look to the future. You know, be on the front lines versus be proactive rather than reactive when it comes to your uh, shopper marketing budget. So a follow-up question on that that we had a that we had written down was is SEO dead? I'm going to assume everyone on the panel is going to say no. Um, I think you know the best way to kind of wrap that up is just by saying it's not dead. It's just you might have to go in and modify and adjust and change constantly changing. It's not a one-time strategy. It's it's a constantly changing and evolving strategy. 
Would anyone like to add anything to that? Yeah, you have to update those pages all the time. Um, we were running a, a, a little beverage company uh, that I was run, working with, and they had a, um, a summer campaign, and you know, we went and I looked online to see what the, you know, their million dollar spend was driving to, which was their item page, and so they still had the polar bears from winter on. <laughs> on the packaging, you know? So if you're gonna do it, you've gotta make sure that it's updated regularly so that you can stay in sync with what your customer's gonna see in store and online. Absolutely. Yeah, it's um, something you gotta update a lot. And so I recommend definitely get on one of these forums that they have for SEO professionals and, and learn, go on YouTube. I mean, I learned so much off YouTube. I learned how to tie a tie on YouTube. Um, I'm a parent of two. You know, I have, a, I have a 15 month old and a two month old, and I've learned a lot of parenting techniques off YouTube. I probably shouldn't have said that, but I mean, I mean that's there's um, yeah, yeah. I mean, but, I mean, you can learn all the, a lot of stuff off of YouTube. Take some time and, and look at these videos and how to write into basic HTML and learn how to how the new Google updates and their algorithm look at content and how it's written. So that it, it's huge. So it's an ever evolving and changing process in SEO. So when people say, oh, it's dead or it's just a fad, it's not. It's not going to go anywhere because it keeps changing. So it's something that we're always going to have to adapt. When this last update happened at the beginning of March. I have suppliers and people that I know that have lost 50% of their visibility because they would update it every three months, four months. I am in my SKUs at least once a month updating SEO and changing search terms and running, you know, crawling different competitors, you know, items and seeing what they're ranking for and if they're growing. And so if you have this, it's, it's not dead and it's, it, I think, if anything, it's, it's, it's kind of just starting because still there's a lot of people that are still thinking this is a fad and that it's something that's new and you know not really going anywhere but it's be on the front lines proactive not reactive does anyone any brand team members here today feel like e-commerce is kind of their five to seven job is anyone here kind of juggling their own you know role responsibilities but then e-commerce has been kind of thrown on top of them yeah we've seen I see a couple like I don't want to put my hand up too high and <laughs> Great. So, you know, whenever you feel like e-commerce is your five to seven job, it might not be realistic to have to learn how, how, do I, how do I optimize my item page. And again, I mean, that's why White Spider exists and, and their new proprietary platform, SKU Ninja, where they can go in and, and you can see all of your products online and what is um, compliant, what's not compliant, what's performing, what's not performing. I mean, the, there are tools that you can leverage to stay ahead of the game while, you know, you can take your five to seven job and, and make it pretty much non-existent and still win. Yeah. Um, yes, sir. Please. Well, let me, let me wrap that question up into our next question, which is really trying to find all of the different elements, connecting all the elements of the shopper journey. So whenever you're identifying customer journey, it's not just a digital strategy. It's not just sales objectives. It's not just shopper marketing. It is all the different components of your brand team trying to find a way to mesh together. How do we make that happen? Well, I think that um, it, it was like this when social media started back, you know, eight, ten years ago when nobody, we didn't know where that spend was owned. Was it owned by the brand or was it owned by the shopper marketing team? So it's an evolution, I think, where I see a lot of different companies. I'm in a lot of different doors and um, a company like Nestle is really far ahead, I think. They've kind of assigned a, a, a shopper marketer. They're recruiting for a shopper marketer for e-commerce. So that person who's looking at what's happening in store and online and making sure that those two are aligned, there's companies are having to restructure in order to make sure that we are maximizing um, the e-commerce sites and the digital spend. Yeah, I'll just add, um, we look at it holistically. So we, I work really, I'm um, with Kimberly Clark and I work really closely with our e-com sales manager and it's part of our planning process. We have, um, you know, dedicated time spent determining what the best avenues are to gr drive growth on e-com as well as brick and mortar. And when I'm looking at my plan, it's a total 360 on how we're driving that omni-channel um, solution for our, all of our brands. So I'm, 
I don't know if everybody's doing it that way, but we're definitely focused on e-com, um, and we have that relationship with our e-com manager. Who, who funds that is the question. Um, so I'm sure everybody funds it a little bit differently, but it, if it is a, a marketing spend, it typically comes out of like a marketing budget, um, and it's, it's part of driving growth at your retailer. So I think it depends on how each company is structured, um, but on ours, it, it's, a separate, uh, it's a separate bucket than trade. That's what I was just going to say. I think it's, I've seen it funded in a variety of different places, but it's always separate from trade. Um, I think it's, um, despite the fact that it is actually um, driving <laughs> direct sales, uh, it's, it's, a protect, it's been a protected budget in pretty much every one of the companies I work with. What I am seeing is that the shopper marketing is often the one person who is end-to-end -end oriented. Uh, sometimes there, there is a uh, sales person who's focused on the buyer for brick and mortar. I mean, look at the way Walmart is. And then you have a sales person who's focused um, on San Bruno or Jet. And the shopper, markety, shopper marketer tends to be the one person who is taking a look end to end. And I think that that's, that's why, again, we called it a team sport because fixing it may not be your responsibility or come out of your budget, but being that advocate for the shopper and eliminating the breakage along the way, I think is a core responsibility that shopper marketers should have. I'm going to follow up with that is then how do you take all these different solutions that are on the market and make them work together? I think that might have been a little bit of the question as well. I think definitely kind of making these all work together. Um, from my experience is starting, like I said, with the basics. So getting a plan of action together, getting your, you know, first five to six weeks plan down, then you're, you're, you're six months, then you're one year, and, and getting a structured plan together and having, having, having checkpoints along the way where you're analyzing and looking at what you've did. Okay, so I, I uploaded this content, I got this response. I uploaded these keywords, I got this response. And then at, after, you know, the, at the six month point, you know, after you've had a few health audits over your SEO and your content, look into going and doing, you know, WMX or paid services. And so, you know, I think they all work together, but they need to be in, you know, an echelon where you're working on, you know, the basics to the most advanced, so max out the basics. And then they'll all work together even better, you know, when it comes to WMX or, or if you're doing any paid or sponsorship or, or, or Google, Google advertising. It's going to make a huge difference if you already have that foundation right there. So I was going to say, um, I actually have us all work together in the same room to work on our plan. So that's something different that I uh, approached it a little, planning differently this year was to have any of my providers all meet together and brainstorm together on how we were gonna optimize each other. Um, and also from a data perspective, how we were gonna take that data and what could one vendor take from another le uh, learning um, and really make that the most efficient spend across each one of those partners. Um, so that's worked really well. Uh, we're gonna be kick we've been kicking that off. Um, and then we'll be having those optimization check-in points too. So this is what the plan was, but what's working, what's not working, and how can we continue to optimize those plans throughout the year. That's fabulous. So Cody, I'm gonna follow up. Um, a question that was texted in, which is very relevant to what you've just said, was how important is the ownership of the customer data to the brands? Um, a reference that is made in the question is, it seems like there's a tug of war between the brands and the platforms of ownership of data. Yeah, so there, there is, but I think our, our brands, are, are, from our perspective, are really willing to listen and learn as well. So they've often asked, you know, who are we working with and what are we learning? And maybe they want to work with them too and learn from them too. Um, our shopper or consumer, you know, really is the same across. Um, and so they need to understand, especially with I deal with some sensitive brands, like who, who are we reaching and how are we reaching them and is there a more effective way um, to close that sale, you know, at our given retailer. And so, yes, we kind of own that data, but I mean, we're, we're not gonna take it and run. <laughs> it's just, it's, we wanna learn and optimize from each other. Um, and that's how we're all gonna get better and stronger together. So before choosing solutions and how we're gonna execute the strategy, of course, comes our digital metrics. 
which ones do you think are the most key to be focused on whenever you're designing a strategy? If you're even visible. <laughs> I mean, if you show up. So that's the first thing. So if you got everything done, you're compliant, you got your items up, you got, um, you know, you're there, make yourself findable, you know? Like, that's probably one of the biggest, you know, biggest questions is how do I, how do I get, you know, from the ninth page on Walmart and the 30th page on Google to actually existing? So if you're not on the first page, you don't exist. And if you're not on the top, you know, 15 search results, I really don't think you're relevant. So that's probably the first thing, even before looking into to sales or, or any of that other data, is really actually being there. Because if you're not visible, you're not going to be making sales. So I think that's probably the first big steps I do once everything's compliant and ready to go is how do I get from, you know, second page to first page? How do I get from... You know, how, how do I get people to my page? What do I do? What action steps? What words can I use? What content can I use? Um, and, 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 and then go from there. Before we go through some of the questions that have been texted in and open the floor, I have one last question for each panelist. It is, what is the single most important thing that I need to know about digital marketing? Very broad question. It is. <laughs> Even though it's saying one thing. Yeah. It opens the doors. I think, I think you have to look at it as a holistic ecosystem. That's, if I was to say this is one thought about digital, it's an ecosystem and it all connects somewhere. And, you know, use your mind and your, creati your creativity to see how you can make those connections stronger. I would say know your shopper, know your retailer, uh, know where she is or he is. Um, reach them at the right time with the right content um, at the right place. Um, and then measure wh what you can. I mean, I know measurement is, um, you know, hard to define like that true one-to-one -one ratio, um, but there are tools available that we can measure in the best ways that we know how. And so understand those measurements and then continue to optimize along the way. As we've discussed many times, it's going to keep changing, so we have to refresh um, our plans, we have to refresh our designs, we have to talk to her in different ways as she's going through that purchase cycle. Um, so, yeah. I would just say be really clear about what the strategy is for your digital solution. Um, are you trying to drive a sale online because it's an item that requires a lot of discretion? So if you're an adult incontinence, it's highly unlikely that you really the shopper really wants to buy an adult incontinence product and check out at Walmart next to their neighbors. So in that situation, you may have the strategy for digital that's really focused on buying and buying in a regimen. Then you ought to make sure that it's, it does that. If it's about helping someone get information, ratings and reviews at point of sale in a bricks and mortar store, then it ought to be designed to trigger when someone walks into a store, and it ought to be designed when someone's in front of that shelf. So I feel like the absence of an intentional strategy on the front end for what you want it to do is where, the, where it falls apart. So that's the one piece I would ask people to do. I think for me, it's definitely connect and create confidence. So you want to connect each of your, each of your, uh, your shoppers to your, to your page, have a connection with your content, have a connection with your item. People are more likely to, you know, purchase something if there's good content because they'll feel a connection with that item. And so definitely, you know, make content that connects, right? And then create confidence. So understand your consumers. Understand for each retailer. For every retailer is going to be different. You know, when I'm, when I'm creating content for a Walmart, you know, um, Walmart, uh, same item that's at Walmart, Amazon, Costco, they're going to be totally different because I'm going to be focusing on that consumer type that shops at those uh, retailers. So create confidence and reach out to all the, you know, those personality types and think about, okay, so some people like you know, paragraphs or bullet points or, or images or whatever. Make sure that you're putting content on there that is going to give people confidence to click buy. We have a few more minutes. If you have questions, please text them in. I'm going to just go through a couple of these. One that I think stands out is saying, I have spent a significant amount of digital dollars, some incredibly effective 40 to 1 return, and some not. Why is it such a guessing game with your ROI on a campaign in digital? I think part of that is recognizing which part of the strategy, what platform to use, 
for what kind of category, what kind of product within the category. It, it, it's not a one size fits all and, and understanding and having you know experience across many categories, it, it is quite different for femcare than it is to sell cake mixes and I, you know you approach it very differently. So my follow-up question is, what if I had planned it? I, I thought I was very concentrated. I had the correct content at the right time to the right um, audience who I was hoping to target, but campaign A was very successful and campaign B was not successful, yet I planned them with the same thoughts in mind. Mm, what, what, you know, <laughs> well, what, what would that timeout look like? What, okay, so maybe what's the first thing I do to go back to the drawing board? What else was going on? Like what else was going on beside your digital strategy? Was there an FSI drop from your brand? Was there other social media going on? Was there something in the marketplace that happened against your brand? Like a competitor. <laughs> yeah. So there's just so many other outside influences that that could happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I would I would take a, a yeah a look back to say what else was going on between A and B uh, to understand the differences um, in those two campaigns because there could have been something significantly different on one versus the other. Yeah, like if your competitor is running a coupon and practically giving away the product, you're going to have a bit of a tough time. Also, I'd like to understand how they were measuring, you know, that data, you know, and, and with which retailer or, 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 so, I mean, I, I've had to, in the past, kind of develop my own hybrid type of reporting and, and, and baselines and, and ranking to, to see a true ROI and work with buyers or people that are um, or, or my merchandising team to say, hey, okay, so where, where do I stand? What do your numbers look like? Here's what I put together. Here's what I can see. Here's my hybrid report that I put together, you know, via using page traffic, using sales, using this, this, and this. And what do you see? And kind of have that open communication. And then I can really establish, okay, this, this is either a, a, a success or failure. But any, either way, time out. Because one of the best things you can do with shopper marketing, especially in the e-commerce world, is we implement and then we analyze, implement again, and we analyze again, and it's constant, so these health audits, you need to be auditing your content, auditing your, your SKUs on a monthly basis. There's, there's no, you know, some people are like, oh, I'm gonna go in there, I did a health audit, and that's where I stand, and I fixed it. Okay, did you do that this last month? No, what about the month before? No, every month, be in there, be in your SKU pages if you can, and audit those. Another question that we've had, I'm gonna kind of reword it here, is just saying, you know, your boss is telling you, you know, we have to be ahead of trend, we have to do everything that's cutting edge, but these are the shiny objects, right? So how, how do I differentiate between what's shiny and what's expensive but's gonna get the job done? And I, I think we understand the basic of that, which is, you know, you sit down, you, you compare, you contrast, all the different tools on the market, but what, maybe what are some secrets to empower people whenever they're um, meeting with the solution providers, hearing the pitches, trying to decide what fits, what doesn't fit. I would just start with a discipline of having, you know, 80% of your budget focused on the things that are going to deliver your firm and 20% of your budget focused on helping you build a better plan next year through test and learn. If you have that kind of a discipline, then you have money to engage with the shiny object suppliers that scare the shit out of you, um, lack of a better word, because they're talking about new capabilities that you don't understand and you need to learn that. But if that gets out of balance, you won't deliver an ROI because you don't yet have your best practices codified for yourself. So I think it's really important to start with that discipline. Yeah, focus on that foundation. So start, go back to the basics. It's the best thing you can do. You know, don't focus on, you know, the paint color, the drapes, whatever. Build that foundation. Maybe put a little bit of, like, um, stain on the cement, you know what I'm saying? Like, the, in, like, make it look, you know, go back to that and make that the best first. But don't, don't be focusing on those shiny, you know, ROI, you know, like, hey, here's this campaign we can do for you. Don't focus on that yet. And that's something so many suppliers I work with, they get caught up in. They're like, can you fly out to San Bruno with me? And we're going to meet in a w, we're gonna have a WMX meeting. I want you to be there for that. And I'm like, well, let me look at your SKU pages. Let's see if we have a good foundation first. So build that foundation before we go into, okay, we're, you know, here's the shiny, you know, you know paid pay-per-click or being sponsored or, or whatnot. So a follow-up to that is, um, you know, how do, if we choose to outsource some of our work, what could be delegated and then what things should remain close to the team? 
So actually, last night we had a, a we we do these e-commerce meetups through supplier community, and it was it was it was amazing. We had some amazing, we had a Q and A for a couple hours that ended up being, um, and these questions kind of came up. Um, and so one of the best practices, and this is something I've really recommended for me that I've used and implemented, is is find a college student that had just graduated or somebody that knows how to do VBA or or, or, or basic coding. And, and if, you, if you need to delegate some work, if, if you're able to make get contractors, have them put some macros in an Excel sheet and hold your master catalog. And that's something I had done, and it was amazing. Like, I was able to, you know, um, maintain, you know, at one point I was maintaining over 13,000 items on Walmart and Amazon. And I was able to do that in an Excel sheet, you know, because I had somebody develop, a ma you know, this, this master catalog with an Excel, and it was amazing. So find that find somebody out of college that can you know that can write HTML and write the code for you to put your search engine optimization in. And it's a it's a very feasible, cheap way, but you're also empowering somebody that's out of college, you know, to 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 get on the job market as well. So it's kind of uh, a win-win. So the remaining questions I've been texting, I feel like we've covered. Would anyone like to ask a question from the floor? then I think we are finished. Why don't we give our panelists a round of applause? <laughs>